Gregory Marinovsky was born in Batumi, Georgia to a Jewish family in 1899. His early life is that of the average Soviet citizen. He would study at the University of Tbilisi, continuing his education at the Medical Institute in Moscow. He took a position at the Bach Institute of Biochemistry and worked his way up from researcher to senior researcher, became head of toxicology department, and ultimately became the deputy director. In 1935, he would be summoned to the All-Union Institute of Experimental Medicine. They would place him as head of the secret toxicology lab. In 1937, Gregory had become head of Laboratory X, formerly Laboratory 1, an extremely secret department of the NKVD that was created to find the perfect tasteless, odorless, and undetectable substance for assassinations, oversaw by the Minister of State Security, Lavrenti Beria. Despite the name changes, different leadership, and locations, the mission remained the same. Create an untraceable, undetectable poison that could be used by the Soviets to assassinate anyone they choose without a trace. The lab was divided into five chambers to monitor their test subjects. Some test subjects were locked into a cell for days after being poisoned without food, water, or human contact. Each test substance was tested on at least 10 humans of both genders, various ages, and health conditions. If they survived the poison, starvation, and dehydration, Marinovsky ordered them to be killed. But this wasn't a mercy killing. They'd be shot in a non-vital body part with small explosive rounds packed with acontinine, an alkaloid toxin made from various plant species. Their death would take 15 minutes to an hour on average according to the head of the unit. The psychological toll on the laboratory workers was damaging to say the least. Falling into depression, drug use, and at least two employees committed suicide. This, however, did not bother Marinovsky. He continued his search as normal, testing a tasteless form of mustard gas. This ultimately would fail because it could be found in post-mortem toxicology tests. The following years, he would test ricin, colchicine, thallium, digitoxin, among others. Most of the human test subjects were taken from the gulags, so a true number of how many people were murdered as a result of these tests is unknown. Marinovsky would make a breakthrough with carbilamine cloline chloride. Reports stated that after administration, test subjects would rapidly weaken, calm down, and go completely silent and ultimately die after 15 minutes. Unknowing pathologists listed the cause of death as heart failure. They had found their perfect substance. This wasn't the end of Marinovsky's testing, though. Pulling more human subjects from the gulags, he worked for the perfect delivery method for the C2. He would administer it orally with food and water. A starving prisoner wouldn't hesitate to get their hands on what they believed to be a free meal, tested it as an injection under the guise of a medical vaccination, put in an aerosol spray that would be absorbed through the skin, also with needles hidden inside canes, umbrellas, fountain pens. Georgi Markov was a beloved influential novelist and playwright in his native country of Bulgaria, but he defected to the United Kingdom in 1969 when communist authorities started to censor him and ban his plays. In September 1978, Markov walked across the Waterloo Bridge over the River Thames. After he got to this bus stop, he felt a sharp pain in his right thigh, and later said he remembered seeing a man next to him fumbling with an umbrella. What Markov did not know is that he had just been victimized in a James Bond-like Cold War plot. The umbrella was actually a poisonous gadget that shot out this tiny platinum ball, a ball containing the deadly poison ricin. And back to his original execution method, bullets filled with it. In 1942, Marinovsky made the discovery that after dosing subjects with ricin at a specific dose, the subject allegedly became more open and honest. Bringing this finding to the NKVD leadership, he would get the green light and funding to continue his research on this new quote-unquote truth serum. Two years after experimentation on people in the laboratory in Lubyanka prison, and with some success in getting confessions, more often than not, it just killed the person. In 1949, the Soviets wanted something bigger. Instructed by Beria, Marinovsky came up with a method to poison large crowds of people at once. It's uncertain if this was actually deployed in testing or on specific targets, or if it was just studied as an option if it was ever needed. It's uncertain how many people were killed by Marinovsky's testing, but KGB colonel Vladimir Bobrinov states the victim were Gulag prisoners, German and Japanese POWs, and also Polish, Korean, and Chinese citizens. After World War II, Marinovsky was sent with two others to Germany to find German specialists in toxic substances. However, they would find that the Germans didn't have nearly the extensive research in poisons that the USSR did. In 1951, Marinovsky and some of his co-workers were arrested on charges of negligence, possession of illegal poisons, and conspiracy to seize power and destroy state leaders. This would be known as the Doctor's Plot. In January of 1953, Stalin stuns the Russian people by publicly charging that traitors are at work within the Kremlin. They have hired a group of doctors, he says, to assassinate loyal communist officials. Stalin vows to uncover the traitors behind the doctor plot and bring them to justice. Then suddenly, from within the walls of the Kremlin, an astonishing bulletin is issued. 
Joseph Stalin is gravely ill, it says. He has suffered a cerebral hemorrhage. Then, on March 5th, 1953, Joseph Stalin is dead. After serving 10 years, he would be released and become the head of a biochemistry lab in Mahatkala, Dagestan. Just two years later, Marinovsky would be found dead in his bed from the notorious heart failure. It's uncertain if this was natural causes or Dr. Death receiving a dose of his own medicine. In March of 1953, the lab was renamed again to Laboratory 12. In 1978, it would be incorporated into the Central Investigation Institute for Special Technology under the KGB. Laboratory 12 was changed to the Kamara, which translates to the cell or the chamber, under Joseph Salin. It was allegedly closed in 1991, but in the late 90s its operations would continue in multiple different laboratories. It is believed that some of these labs are still in use today. 